Welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intel, forecasts, and strategies. Hello, I'm Michael Bull. Thank you for being with us. Our show today is brought to you by Commercial Agent Success Strategies. Check it out. There's 21 one-hour videos. You know who produced them. It's me. <laughs> it's me. So obviously, I like them. They're great, right? Actually, the brokers around the country, even the most experienced ones, rave about these videos. Uh, if you're a commercial agent, we want to be better at it. We want to produce more results for your clients. Learn more at Commercial Agent Success. Dot com. Well, today we're going to talk to Ryan Severino, Chief Economist with BGO. And those of you who have listened to our show for years have heard uh, of Ryan over the years. He's one of our favorites. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for being with us. Hey, Michael. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. And, you know, Ryan, you know, we were laughing before the show here that, uh, you know, how can we talk about uh, real estate and the economy without talking about the re election results, right? It's like... <laughs> It's yeah, the, as I joked, it's sort of like Fight Club. I think the first rules were not supposed to talk about it. <laughs> right. We're not supposed to talk about it. But, you know, it, 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 it does have some impact, I guess, on the economy. It does have some impact uh, on commercial real estate or at least, you know, emotionally it feels like it should. So I know we've seen uh, activity pick up uh, since the election results with more activity on our on our listings and stuff. So obviously it does have some impact. So just overall, Ryan, with uh, Trump being uh, the president elect, what do you think the impact so far or, or might be with with the overall economy? You know, it, it certainly feels like it, it, if we simply just go by by market reaction, that people are feeling heartened about this. I think at least the perception is that it's probably going to be an administration that leans a little bit toward tax cuts, or at least not tax increases, probably an administration that leans toward um, maybe not outright deregulation, but at least has, has a little bit of a, of a, of a skew toward deregulation. Uh, I think it's a little bit early to know definitively what is and is not going to happen. But to the question you asked about how people are feeling about this and how it might be showing up in the economy, it certainly feels like there's, at least in the short term, this sense of renewed optimism about the economy, which I think is interesting because, you know, for my money, I think the economy has been in a good place for a long time. I've been, um, a, I think, a stalwart defender of the economy for the last, you know, three, four years, even with the Fed raising rates. And so um, I think this might be just a continuation that, that the economy will probably take pretty good momentum with it into 2025. And then we'll, you know, we'll have to see what the specific policy prescriptions look like, but certainly gauging the public market's reaction, um, it looks favorable from their point of view, to say the least. Right. And then to your point, I mean, everything any uh, elected official says when they're uh, trying to get elected, of course, everything they mention, they say they're going to do always, always happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I hate to be so, you know, cynical, but but I think that that is one of the t to be completely fair about it. I think that's one of the issues that we we face right now. That there's chatter during primary season, and then there's chatter during the general election season, and then there's the question of what can actually get accomplished in a in a system that I think was intentionally designed to divide power, right? The separation of powers among the different branches of government, and even with you know, that maybe not being having worked out exactly the way the founders thought that it might, there's still some truth to that. There are still checks and balances to an extent in the system. There are still guardrails in the system. And so I think we're just going to have to see how some of this stuff plays out. If anything, I think the one thing to me, when I try to peer into the crystal ball and think about where the economy's going, even if we're going to get some kind of change in stance, differences in policies, it will take some amount of time for those to actually start to impact the overall economy. Um, so I look into the crystal ball at least you know, 12, 24 months in advance. And I think, um, like I said, this economy's got such good momentum. I think it's got a chance to perform well again next year. And then, and then I think you know, we'll have to revisit specific policy decisions and see what happens. But short to medium term, I, I still feel pretty optimistic about the economy one way or another. Let's talk about a few of the things that uh, he's mentioned that he plans to do. Um, you know, when um, Biden got in, he kind of shut down a lot of old production in the U.S. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> I guess Trump's uh, on, on the podium was like, drill, baby, drill. Um, if it, we're able to produce more oil in, in the U.S., 
um, might that have an impact on inflation? It seems like oil prices or gas prices kind of impact everything that we we consume. What might be uh, the impact there? Yeah, I think one of the things that again, going back to how incredible the U.S. economy is, not not to sound like a cheerleader for it, but I don't think I don't think there are a lot of people out there that really appreciate that you that the U.S. is now the dominant energy producer in the world, at least as it pertains to what we think of as those traditional sources. Uh, in some respects, we're actually a, a pretty substantial exporter of, um, of, of petroleum petrochemical products. I think anything that in the short to medium term can keep us in that position is going to help. You know, it helps from a, from a geopolitical point of view. It certainly helps from a resiliency point of view. Um, I think as everybody knows, you know, energy is a, is a fairly significant cost to most households. So any, any time that the U.S. can, can have the ability to produce more, to be a check on, you know, whatever the other oil producing nations of the world decide, you know, to do from one period to the next, um, it's nice to be in the position where we can maybe not be the swing provider per se, um, but certainly be willing to step into a position where we're not constrained in production the way that we were, you know, say in the the seventies when we had, you know, oil crises and geopolitical events. And so I think the U S has done an incredible job of becoming that dominant energy producer in the world. And I, I just, I don't see anything really upsetting that anytime soon, if anything, um, you know, we probably have more of an advantage relative to the rest of the world because of our technology than, than we had, you know, even five or 10 years ago. Would increase, production in the U.S. Um, tend to bring gas prices down some? It could. A lot of that will depend on, you know, what other countries around the world decide to do with their productive capacity. So again, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to say in isolation, but there isn't, put it this way, increasing supply um, would almost certainly not have uh, inflationary pressure on energy prices. And so there's not, the question in my mind really becomes, for energy producers in the US, is it profitable at a, at a certain price point, right? Does it make sense for them to go out and you know, drill new wells or, or, or whatever they're, they happen to be doing? I think that to me is, is a bit of the bigger question than the broader sort of supply demand dynamics. I think it's, it's unambiguously clear that if we're going to continue to push the production side, the supply side, then that would be good for pricing. The one thing that I, I, I don't know without knowing too much about the specifics is whether or not they would think it would be profitable to, to increase production and, and drill new wells. But um, from, a, from a pure supply demand point of view, there, there really isn't a lot of downside to that. That's a good point. You know, based on the amount of calls I get uh, from people wanting me to invest in a new, new oil rigs, <laughs> there must be a lot of production. <clears throat> you know? uh, I'm on some list that thinks I want to invest in things like that. So, uh, um, let, let's talk about Ryan, your thoughts on, on tariffs. If, um, if, uh, Trump is able to pr create some, uh, tariffs on China and other countries on imports to the U S uh, what's the chances of that and what might the impact be? You know, this is, this is one of those really big unknown, you know, I'm going to channel my inner Donald Rumsfeld for a minute. One of those sort of known unknowns, because, this is one area of policymaking where where Congress has really given a pretty wide berth to the executive branch. I think it really depends on on a couple of things. Number one, how widespread they are, and number two, the magnitude of them. Which again, you know, as we sit here, you know, so soon after the election, I think is is difficult to say. From my point of view, I look at it as as does it accomplish a strategic a strategic goal? Is there a reason to go after certain products? For example, um, I, I think as, as a lot of listeners probably know, um, China right now is running um, what, what, I'll, what I'll just call sort of excess production, excess capacity. So in, in effect, with some products and services, they're being accused of price dumping in some of the world. Even you know the European Union, which has, has benefited greatly from um, from trade with China over the last couple of decades, is now starting to put you know more I don't want to call them barriers to trade. So let's just be a little bit euphemistic and say restrictions around trade. I think in those kinds of instances where there's, you know, evidence of price dumping or, or damage to the to the domestic production productive capacity, I think there's an argument to be made. If there's a national security issue, I think there's certainly an argument to be made there. I think where it could become a potentially a little bit more problematic is if it isn't so targeted. If it's if it's not 
such a selective thing, if it becomes on, on a much more widespread basis, especially if it's at a punitive level, that in my mind could potentially do two things. Number one, you know, it raises the cost of a lot of imports. And so it has, it tends to have an inflationary impact more than anything. But then secondly, you run the risk of getting into some kind of, you know, internecine race to the bottom trade war with a bunch of trading partners around the world, which not only makes it you know, more expensive for us as consumers to buy certain things, but it makes it more difficult for American industry to export. So I think it really is a question of, again, how widespread they are and the magnitude uh, of, of what the specific tariffs could be. But um, I think we're, again, we're, we're, we'll have to see a little bit in terms of how aggressive they're willing to be on this. Thus far, um, I, I think the, poly, the, the tariffs that were put in place during Trump's previous administration, with the, which the Biden administration by and large left in place, haven't been catastrophic for the economy. Clearly, we went through some inflation over the last few years, but I would not ascribe that to, to trade policy specifically. That was a, a whole bunch of other things that went on in the world. So I think there are ways they could play this without it being really inflationary. But I, I think it's difficult to say until we actually hear some of the things that they're, they're thinking about implementing. Yeah, of, of the several things that are kind of top of his list that uh, he's talked about doing that one, and it makes me the most most nervous. But uh, what about uh, his border policy? Uh, how might that impact economy and, and commercial real estate changes there? Yeah, again, I think this is one of those questions, that, again, not to, to joke and be cynical about this, but I, I think the real issue is, you know, can they go out and implement this policy, which to me is far from clear, right? Shutting the border or controlling the border is one thing. I think you know, the, the issue of deportation and what it could do to the supply side of the labor market, that to me is far from clear. It, it's unclear to me, um, not, not so much the legality of it, but, but, you know, what kind of pushback you would get, whether or not the courts would step in. Um, in order to do that, it, it would take a pretty sizable, um, sizable amount of money. I, I don't know that Congress is willing to fund the dollar amounts that that have been thrown about in order to actually implement something so aggressive. So I think it's easier to, to, to start putting, I think, some restrictions on entry into place. I think it's a little more problematic in terms of what they intend to do about, about um, people who might already be in the country and, and, and what the policies are on the other side of that. So um, I, I think there's a lot of moving parts to that. Um, there are right ways and wrong ways that, that you know, we could go about immigration policy in the U.S., um, but I'll leave that to people who are much more politically <laughs> motivated than me to kind of hash those things out. Yeah. You mentioned inflation a few times. You know, uh, what do you expect moving forward for inflation right now? You know, I, I still think that we're in a good spot. I, I've been very... Um, overtly critical of how we measure inflation in the U.S. That's one of the things that I, I don't think that we do a very good job of. And I, I don't want to get lost down that rabbit hole. But what I would simply say is um, if you just look at the standard measures that we, we tend to focus on, CPI, uh, PCE on both a headline and a core basis, we're pretty much back to target. We're, we're slightly above target by some measures, but, but back to target. I think if we were a little bit, I'll just be polite and say different in how we measured inflation, um, you could actually see us being below target. I think next year has a tremendous opportunity for that, this disinflationary process to continue. One of the reasons why it's gotten hung up a little bit over the course of uh, the last, oh, let's call it the last half of this year or so, is that we didn't have much inflation in the last half of last year. And so when you do that year over year calculation for the annual inflation rate, it's not so much that inflation isn't slowing down uh, on a month to month basis. It's just when you do the year over year calculation, it looks like we're not making that much progress. By the time we get to the early stages of, of next year, you know, January, February, March, where there were some, some temporary inflationary pressures in those months, I think that is where we'll really start to see inflation, um, even, even with the imperfect ways that I, I think that we measured in the US, really heading back, uh, back to, to being at or below target across measures. So I, I, to me, I think it's really just a, more of a measurement issue than anything. And given uh, a little bit more time, I think it'll, it'll be a little more transparent that We've, we've by and large accomplished what, uh, what we set out to do in bringing inflation back to target. Well, that's good news. And uh, kind of brings us well into kind of my next question for you. And that's uh, 
the Fed's reaction um, <laughs> to to the Trump presidency. He's talked about you know cleaning cleaning <laughs> cleaning them out a little bit, um, and you know they just here we are mid mid November. Uh, they just reduced uh, their Fed's rate what twenty five basis points. Yep. What do you expect them to do moving forward? I still think they're going to be in cutting mode, maybe not as aggressive as the market thought in, say, September when they cut 50 basis points. If you remember, the market got them and, and the market has a tendency to do this. So I'm, I'm not I'm not criticizing the market too much, but I think the market might have gotten over its skis a little bit. They cut 50 basis points. I think you saw the 10 year really pull back in anticipation of that. Then the data came in a little bit hotter than the market was probably expecting. And then there was some concern, it seems like about maybe a Trump administration and maybe some some inflationary pressure next year. You started to see the long end of the curve run up a little bit. For my money, I, I still think the Fed is in a loosening stance. I think they see, and rightfully, I think they see the Fed funds rate even at you know four and a quarter or three quarters or so as still being restrictive to economic activity. I think they have, boy, at least another 100 to 150 basis points they can cut without, without that specific part of the economy contributing to any kind of you know, potential reacceleration and in inflation. I do think that you know, no matter what they say, I do think they will pay attention to what happens on the policy side next year and how that impacts the real economy and metrics like inflation. Um, but I, aside from that, I think they would really like to keep cutting rates and bringing the Fed funds rate down, even if they're maybe not going to be as aggressive as the market would, would like or, or have thought not that long ago. Yeah, I, I really like them to bring it down more. But, you know, I'm out here doing real estate transactions, so go, <laughs> go figure, right? Um, you know, we talk with Ryan Severino, chief economist with BGO, and we're talking about the Trump presidency impact on the economy and, and commercial real estate. So let's go into commercial real estate a little bit. Is there a sector or a, a specific property, uh, maybe even a smaller type of property that you think could benefit uh, from what you see potentially moving forward with the Trump presidency? You know, I don't know if there's one that sticks out, but I think you know, if if we just take the stance that it's going to be in an administration that is, if not cutting taxes, at least they're not going to have an, an aggressive tax cutting, uh, tax raising stance, then that's one variable that we can take out of the equation. The good news about that, you know, and you know, I'm a, I'm in this industry too. I'm not ashamed to ad admit that is that most of what's been, you know, and, and you even alluded to it a, a little bit, you know, even kind of jokingly, but most of what has ailed our industry for the last couple of years has really been, you know, the Fed and interest rates and the cost of capital. And to me, that is really, that's really the crux of this. If the Fed can keep cutting rates and the market adjusts to that, short end of the curve, long end of the curve, then that will be a tremendous elixir for what ails the commercial real estate market. I think, on a, you know, certainly broadly, getting to the property type level, this to me is is where I think the world gets interesting because we've entered a phase where I think there's some property types that are are either hard to invest in or are out of out of favor by a large swath of the investment community, and that feels very different to me versus you know, 15 or so years ago when you know you and I first started talking, or even uh, I'm going to date myself, but. 30-ish years ago when I was a lot younger and, dare I say, cooler and first got into this industry. Um, this is not that landscape. This is a landscape now where it's hard to invest. It's just objectively difficult uh, to invest in certain property types relative to what the world looked like. And I think there's been this, um, this reevaluation of certain major property types and I think a renewed focus on some minor property types or, or secondary property types. Minor is, it sounds a little bit um, a little bit mean spirited, but you know, secondary property types in a way that wasn't the case a, a business cycle or two ago. And to me, that's where I think this industry gets really interesting over, you know, in the next business cycle or two. How does that evolution continue to play out? Um, because I, I, I don't think it's it's wholly clear what's going to happen to to certain property types at this stage. It, not at least not just yet. Yeah, I, I agree. And of course, one of those property types out of favor is for the most 
people or companies is office. And so in, any of you listeners or viewers out there that want to sell office, please call me. Uh, I might buy your office building, uh, but if not, I can sell it for you. I'm really pro office. I think that turns around faster than most people think. But uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm probably more in that mm-hmm. camp. I, mm-hmm. I, I worry that anytime, look, I love this industry. I've been in it a long time, but I think it does have a propensity to kind of catastrophize a little bit and also has a propensity propensity for for group think um everything's got an attractive price at some point i i'm I'm not sure we're just there yet i don't want to be overly optimistic about this um but at some point somewhere along the way somebody very shrewd and intelligent is is going to figure this out um and and they're going to be successful doing it i have i have no doubt about it to me it's more of a question of of when not if yeah and there's been some big moves by some of the big major uh, players on, on acquisitions lately, right? And what's that tell you? Yeah, I, I think you have, you, we, all of us in this industry have really seen what I would cons- I would say is a vote of confidence. You know, some of it is these, you know, very large monolithic institutions that can go out and do that. Um, but they're not stupid. They wouldn't be going out and doing that if they didn't feel confident about you know, the sector overall, and, and certainly whatever the property types are that they're investing in. When I see those kinds of things, to me, it's it's another sign that our industry is really going through this, you know, convalescence, and we're getting to what, what I think is a turning point where we're objectively seeing returns in the industry are better. We haven't reached full stabilization on valuations yet, but we're getting ever closer to that, to that turning point where valuations stabilize and then start uh, to turn and become more positive. And so when I see those kind of big ticket acquisitions hit the newswire, it just makes me think that that the sentiment in the industry is changing. And, you know, say what you want about a, you know, a soft metric like that. Um, that actually matters because the risk premia that we see embedded in discount rates and cap rates, some of that's a function of, of the treasury. Some of that's a function of how property fundamentals are behaving. But some of that's just a function of how investors feel about about the environment, about the outlook. And so to me, that's another sign that the sentiment in the industry is changing and, and maybe um, you know building some momentum in the process so that we can find ourselves in a world next year where everyone feels better about the outlook, everyone feels better about the sector, the cost of capital has gone down, and we get a more conducive transactions market environment than we've had, you know, even this year where I think the Fed didn't didn't move to September. And as a consequence of that, um, I think a lot of people just kind of sat on the sidelines waiting to see what happened until they had a little more confidence in what the Fed was going to do with uh, with monetary policy. Well, I guess you can tell from social media that it's not the facts that matter. It's how we feel about things. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It does, you know, for it. It's a thing, right? Yeah. Like it's it's how consumers feel, how yeah. businesses feel, how investors feel. If it's going to impact their actions to some extent, then we should at least be thinking about it, even if if it's uh, if it doesn't always feel like it's reflective of uh, the reality that we see and live every day. Yeah, I agree, and I, I feel good. I think it's everything's going to be great. So <laughs> let's get your thoughts, uh, Ryan, on on the banks, uh, as you've mentioned, and uh, uh, interest rates, availability of financing really impacts the uh, the economy, really, in businesses and real estate. Uh, what do you expect for the health of, of banks uh, uh, moving forward? And that does these drop in interest rates help them? Yeah, you know, banks are one of those things that if you went back, it, for those, you know, everyone old enough to remember it, to, you know, spring of last year, people thought there was going to be like this huge banking crisis that never actually materialized. I, I think the Fed did some responsible things, stepping in, backstopping a bit. I, I you know, I think by and large, the, the banking sector is in a, in a pretty good spot. I think there are, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush. There are probably some blemishes here and there and some, um, you know, local regional banks where they have a little bit of a selection bias issue in terms of, of lending and, and, you know, what the, what the collateral is like, whether you're talking about properties, um, you're talking about, you know, personal loans, businesses. But, but by and large, uh, the financial sector of the U.S. economy is, is holding up well. And I would, I would include, you know, banks in, in that equation. You know, the markets continue to hit record high levels. Um, you're seeing household balance sheets stronger than they've ever been. You're seeing business balance sheets incredibly strong. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a again, it, fingers crossed that we don't hit something that's that's totally uh, unexpected. But 
I, I think the economic and business environment, especially as it pertains to an asset class like ours, should be favorable, um, you know, more favorable for lenders. Certainly, I think the appetite from borrowers will probably go up. And so um, aside from some, you know, one off uh, blemishes here and there, I, I think it could actually be a pretty good market environment over the next you know, 12, 24 months for anybody who's uh, on the lending side of, of the industry. What are your thoughts on the wall of maturities that we have? You know, a lot of these uh, lenders that we deal a lot with helping lenders with with bad loans and criticized loans. And a lot of times they've extended kind of some people call it pretend and extend. But um, looks like the maturities are, are still coming. Rates are obviously higher than most of these. And some of these folks will be upside down. Do you expect that we'll see more of those properties kind of get worked out or, or, or sold or, or the banks kind of? You think they might still kick it, kick the can down the road a little more? I, 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 I still think there's some pain coming. And, and I say that with the caveat that if you look back historically, um, again, our industry has a, has a bad tendency to catastrophize these things. Even after the GFC, which, which was a mess, I don't, I don't want to you know, mischaracterize history. I certainly don't want to sugarcoat anything. But if you look at the proclamations that were made coming out of the GFC and what actually ended up occurring, it wasn't nearly as bad as it was bad. I, again, I don't I don't want to sugarcoat this. I'm not I don't want to be too you know, Pollyanna-ish about this, but it wasn't it wasn't the abject bloodletting that people thought it was going to be. Same thing with this, right? Are there issues? There are definitely issues. There there are collateral quality issues. Uh, there are revaluation issues. There there certainly are going to be um, issues with with certain property types, subtypes, certain markets. Um, but by and large, I always feel like, and, and I think the empirical evidence backs me up on this, that the calls for blood in the streets almost never quite materialize the way that, um, that people proclaim in advance. But I do think that there, again, there are issues out there on, on a bunch of balance sheets and that is going to have to get worked out. And I think, you know, once rates come in, you'll, they'll, you'll really get, a better sense of, of how much of this stuff just like just doesn't have a prayer anymore that that they won't be able to extend and pretend and that sort of thing. I, I think there are a lot of properties that are probably they're probably fine. I think the majority of the collateral is is probably okay. So I, I, I think there there almost certainly is more pain to come. Um, but I don't think it's going to be the kind of unmitigated disaster that some people like to scaremonger about. Yeah. Well it seems like one of the Fed's um plans is to to solidify the performance of banks and the health of banks. And I think if they all continue to drop those rates at 50 basis points at every meeting, feds, that'll help the banks, right? Let's keep, keep it going, keep it going. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I try not to sound too self-interested in this. Again, fully conceding that I work for a real estate company, but it, this really is the thing that I, I, I think is holding our industry back at this point. And if you want to see a healthier transactions market environment with more volume and greater liquidity, greater availability of debt and more options that we know how to get there. We're not in charge of it. I'm certainly not in charge of it. Um, but we know the path that that can get us back there. And as long as the Fed, I think, stays on any kind of trajectory that seems reasonable to me, you know, bringing rates down over the next 12 to 24 months, then there's no reason to think that we shouldn't see Transaction volume increase. We shouldn't see valuation stabilize and start to increase again. Uh, we shouldn't see an acceleration in returns across the industry. We shouldn't see an improvement in um, debt capital availability, um, underwriting standards, uh, the actual lending volume. Uh, to me, this is really, again, barring some kind of random shock that's outside the purview of the economy itself. This, to me, is really just a big question of, of when, not if at this point. Yeah. Well, good point. And, you know, the brokers level here where we are in the southeast selling all types of commercial properties and apartments, we're certainly seeing transaction activity pick up. All our listings been getting more activity almost every week um, and even more activity since the election results. So, I, you know, it looks like if, uh, when, when we trend that forward, it looks like, you know, we, we are seeing more activity. It seems like our lenders and buyers are more comfortable with their underwriting and more sellers comfortable with, with taking properties to, to market. Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, it, it's a little bit anecdotal, but even from, you know, my point of view at, at, at BGO, I'd say, you know, we are certainly 
busy kicking the tires on deals and we're out there, you know, looking to, to get things done when it's appropriate. Um, I can really only speak for, you know, myself and, and uh, my teammates. I don't want to speak for any other departments, but I can tell if we're busy, you know, helping look at markets and look at deals and think about strategy and those sorts of things. And I'll simply say um, my team and I have been, have been almost uh, incessantly busy and that would not be the case if you know we weren't feeling better about where where we think the world is going and and i think more importantly if the broader market didn't didn't feel better about where they thought the world was going yeah yeah good point yeah i mean we have three like just me uh, i have three con sales contracts being negotiated right now on deals and multiple closings being in the work so it's and that's great news you know for everybody involved in our industry because transaction farm for the last two and a half years has really right. been terrible uh, comparatively speaking. So it's good to see. Well, Ryan, uh, final remarks regarding the, your thoughts moving forward with the Trump presidency and its impact on the economy or CRE. You know, my here's my broad thought. My broad thought, again, I try not to be a cheerleader. This economy has been, been great in a way that I, I don't think most people have probably appreciated. It has endured high inflation, high interest rates, a pandemic, uh, a bunch of other shocks, you know, war in Eastern Europe, Europe, which is the first sort of major war in Europe for the first time since the end of World War II. And we continue to push ahead. You know, we, we continue to produce jobs. We continue to grow wages now faster than inflation. Productivity in the economy is increasing. I think as long as we don't get one of those, you know, low probability, but, but you know, kind of high damage scenarios out of policymaking, there's no reason to think that this economy can't continue to grow through, boy, as far as I'm willing to peer into the crystal ball, let's call it the latter half of this decade. I think this, our economy is incredibly resilient. It's incredibly dynamic. It is, it's so diverse relative to what it was once upon a time. And the real estate market just is a reflection of that, right? Because economic activity to a large extent it is housed in physical structures, right? People still Contrary to some popular opinion, work in offices. They go shopping in retail centers. We store goods in warehouse distribution centers. We have you know, increasing prevalence of data centers that's becoming a, a bigger part of, of our economy. Um, we all live in a, you know, most of us at least live in a dwelling somewhere. So as long as we can avoid those, those low probability but dire scenarios, there's no reason to think that the economy can't continue to expand over the next, uh, again, into the latter half of this decade, and the real estate market shouldn't, you know, should be reflective of that, I would think. Good, good. Well, I feel good, <laughs> thank you for that. So those of you who are just listening and not watching, I'm doing a stupid dance right now, I'm just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> lower rates, more <laughs> transaction economy. Uh, great, uh, Ryan, good to see you, thanks. Uh, great information as usual, thank you, sir. Always my pleasure, Michael, thanks for having me on. All right. And thank you for joining us around the country. Thanks for putting up with my my dancing. <laughs> if you're watching, you're already tuned out. Uh, and uh, I thank you for sharing the show. Please uh, reach out to us if you have any thoughts, any questions and ideas. My email is an easy one. It's Michael at BullRealty.com. Until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn and laugh and join us for America's Commercial Real Estate Show. America's Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Bull Realty, commercial real estate sales, leasing, and advisory services. Visit bullrealty.com or reach out to me directly. My email is michael at bullrealty.com. By ShareFile, designed with real estate and other highly regulated industries in mind, ShareFile offers secure digital solution to simplify workflow and improve collaboration. Visit sharefile.com. By Commercial Agent Success Strategies, 21 cloud accessed agent training videos. Learn more at commercialagentsuccess.com. You're invited to subscribe to the show wherever you listen or watch the show. You're also invited to subscribe to a weekly email announcing the show topic and guests at CREshow.com. Thank you for watching, listening, and sharing America's commercial real estate show.